So I was driving down the uh, non-super, non-information highway the other day, uh, contemplating, as I often do, platonic forms and unusual and remote landscapes and sometimes platonic landscapes. Imperfect permafrost plateaus and golden fjords and noble estuaries and answers to important questions like, are we really just featherless bipeds as Plato quipped? And what kind of psychedelics did Plato take and where can I get some? Um, I was in reverence. Oh, by the way, sorry. There we go. I was in reverence of the rain the other day. Um, put into a hypnotic state by the metronome rhythm of the windshield wipers and the streaming rivulets, missing all of my exits until there were no exits, turning an otherwise bucolic Sunday cruise into an existential Sartrean affair. <laughs> the rain is like the delicious dark side of a sunny day. And a reminder, and a reminder that there's always joy in the darkness. If you happen to be glancing in the right direction and with the appropriate intentions, the sun could be beautiful medicine, but at times a little, a little too intense, kind of like that irritating hyperkinetic person at a social gathering who raves on about carbon offset or blockchain or <laughs> full contact origami or wrestling mythical beasts or whatever, but you sit with it and you learn to let go, whereas the rain is that silent but penetrating participant. The sun is not what it used to be, that fiery god that required occasional sacrifices. You know, I was fanning through the high-priced treasures of Hamaker Schlemmer at a fairly rapid clip, actually using it as a cooling device when the sun was too intense. And lo and behold, there it was, the sun itself, a trillion dollar catalog item, now a mere semiological reduction. You can't sell the rain, and it's just too damn slippery, and remains somehow sacred and symbolic. When it's a drizzle, it's soft and gentle, but when it rages, you migrate further inward to that fire that dances below the stillness of the mantelpiece. I like the cleansing action of the rain. I like the smell, because during the rain, there's lower pressure, which causes environmental elements to waft and dance in front of our noses. It heightens our senses beyond our eyes, and is a reminder that it's okay to cry. The rain is like that wise old woman who taps you on the shoulder and says, this is important. Go this way, not that way. Or go whichever way you like, what the fuck do I care? <laughs> or she says something really bizarre that gets under your skin and forces you to think, I guess I can't think my way through this one. What sound does a one-handed clap make? Did you know that you left your galoshes on the lanai and that your umbrella is leaning slightly to the left as the ancient serpent slithers through the unmowed grass of your mind? I don't know what that means. No one knows what the hell that means, but that's okay. Just let it go. Just let it drip on you. Like watching a classic film and not worry, really thinking about the plot or the characters or the archetypes. Just letting it flow over you like a warm shower of words and art. Okay, did you get that? Okay. Every word. Good. Excellent. All right, so welcome. I'm Prana Shakti Rainstorm Spice. That's my spiritual name. Just, I just made that up just now, so that's going to be my spiritual name for tonight. Um, by the way, I'm seeing some, a sea of red eyes, which is great because you got the memo. So 
You're supposed to be a little high for this talk. I don't know if some of you got the memo, but if you didn't, that's okay. It'll be slightly less interesting. But the good news is you probably won't be reaching into your bags for snacks, because there's no intermission. Sorry, folks. Um, so uh, this is so this sort of ode to rain is kind of something that I do not not to rain, but to different things, colors, rain, whatever. It's sort of like a warm up to kind of ease us into this journey and uh, plant seeds of openness and flexibility and to highlight the importance of having no expectations whatsoever. Um, and this is sort of the tone of my um, talk. It's kind of like, so, you know, when you go to the gym, you go work out, you pump iron or whatever it is they're pumping, polycarbon reinforced nanometals. I don't know what they're pumping these days, but it's a, it's a safety issue. I don't want to <laughs> injure myself. So um, that silence at the beginning, too, it wasn't a lot of silence, but it was a way of trying to tune into your nervous system um, and a way to demonstrate the importance of experiential life, to, to feel rather than to grasp intellectually. And um, just like how I talked about last year, there's more density and more energy within a cubic centimeter of space than all the matter in the observable universe. There's also that horizontal density, that relationship that's so important. So we're kind of really like, you know, we're all one in a way. Um, <clears throat> if you can imagine like a microorganism and like I'm kind of like the flagellate like tail and you guys are the body. Wait a minute, that makes me an ass, I guess. Um, okay, that was horrible, horrible metaphor. But um, in short, what I'm saying is, let what I say drip on you and let me feel your bodies. What was that what I was saying? <laughs> I came out horribly wrong. Or didn't, unless you guys are into that kind of thing. <laughs> and if you are, I am too, OK? This is a collaborative, <laughs> collaborative relationship. So this talk is really about uh, experiential life. And, and leveraging the energy, uh, the power, kind of essence of our surroundings, of which we're an integral component. So it really becomes a way not of ma manipulating the other, but of fine-tuning important aspects of ourselves. And one thing that I learned in uh, many psychedelic sessions is there's uh, the sort of four-way, it's almost like a four-way outlet connection. And if you take care of that, it's like everything else is taken care of. It's the, ver the, you know, the vertical, the connection to the, the divine and then to the earth. And then there's that horizontal connection. Um, and you know, we spend so much time um, you know, reading self-help books and uh, watching self-help videos and even taking more psychedelics. But if we're off balance, if we don't have that pristine four-way connection, um, it clogs the system. I guess you could say. Another key point is that um, we're often defined and limited by culturally mediated constructs, like viewing technology only by the limited or narrow definition of its you know, mechanical or digital nature uses or applications. Right? Um, ayahuasca, for example, is, is like a biological technology or, or a spiritual technology leveraging the energy and essence of you know, social situations or obstacles as its own sort of technolo technology. So by broadening our, our sort of conceptual, ontological, and linguistic spheres, um, we can produce an infinite expansion of possibilities. I mean, imagine the societal implications of referring to ayahuasca as a, you know, as a technology. It's like, no, you can't bust me. This is my tech, bro. <laughs> It's like, this is my iPad, you know? Um, so, <clears throat> and this is one of the, really the most important lessons that I've gained from psychedelics is you have to alter the terms of your habitat, right? Um, there's no need to, to sort of rigorously toil through that, that rickety Byzantine alphabet of the matrix-like labyrinth. Ariadne's thread has been laid down. We need merely to just grab hold. Um, and another example, too, is, you know, I'm sure 
speakers, many speakers out there can attest to this, this nervousness that happens in front of a crowd. Like, what is that? What is that all about? Um, and I think it's that perception of separation, right? I guess you could call it separation anxiety. Um, but sure, maybe, you know, we identify ourselves as an introvert, but what does that even mean? Um, and sure, maybe it has to do with learning histories and um, complexes, and maybe we have a, a higher level of internal physiological arousal, but learning can be unraveled, perceptions can be altered, and the intensity of energy can be channeled and redirected to, go, to move far beyond those flimsy concepts to forge a newer and more exciting uh, reality. Um, so again, alter the terms of your habitat. It's like that, that Easter egg that you find in video games, right? That's like a reality. It's like sort of a symbol that's connecting all these levels of reality. Um, has anyone seen Ready Player One? Oh, it's just so spot on when he finds the Easter egg. I don't want to give it away, but it's brilliant when he does. Um, so I kind of liken the psychedelic experience to finding that shortcut or that wormhole or that hack. Um, and um, it's like we're caught on this sort of like, should I choose this side or that side? It's like, no, just merge, you know, go with the flow. Uh, sometimes you have to go backward to go forward. Um, and I feel that we're all born with a sort of like Rubik's Cube and it's like we spend our entire lives using linear logic and you know, after a couple decades, we finally figure it out, but maybe we stumble upon a hack and it doesn't involve peeling the stickers off either. Um, by the way, I've hidden a linguistic and conceptual tone-based Easter egg within this presentation. So those who find it will unlock the golden key of Melchior and the first clue to a possible interpretation of the Voynich manuscript. <laughs> kind of not really jiving with the, the slides here. There we go. Okay. Um, so again, this is one of the most important lessons uh, I've gained from psychedelics. Not an intellectual understanding, but a way uh, in which I gained a greater awareness of the texture of life. Right, it's eddies and fields and fluctuations and striations and um, where the resistance is and is not, and where the flow is low and where there's a lot and how complex systems and constellations are made up of contingent articulations among myriad heterogeneous elements. Um, and this is kind of why I design my, my talks in a certain way. Um, it's sort of texture based. So all the information, important information that I need to convey is sort of embedded within the absurdity and tonality and meter and, and rhythm and poetry. Um, so anyone ever uh, been corrected when you use the term psychedelics? And they're like, no, it's, it's entheogens, man. <laughs> I feel like we've kind of sort of gone through that. Like we've gone through that territory. We've figured out what we needed to. Um, I, I was in the entheogen camp, but I kind of like the term itself, psychedelics. It, um, it's slightly more conducive to airstream. It has sort of a more consistently staccato grab that hugs that alveolar ridge at the roof of the mouth as it's being uttered. A little less slippery, more glide. Entheogen is a, is a good term. Um, so it's almost diphthongy. I don't know, a little mental, kind of dental. But um, entheogenesis, now there is a sexy linguistic transformation, like when the nerdy kid starts wearing contact lenses and sunglasses. <laughs> and by contact lenses, I mean uh, augmented reality capable of encoded neural net memory link. And by sunglasses, I mean VR projection lenses with built-in electromagnetic Bluetooth transceiver capabilities. Because that's the kind of sunglasses a nerd would wear. And by nerd, I mean nerd nouveau. Um, so I forgot to mention, um, some of you were here uh, last year. And um, I would like to mention again that this presentation is being sponsored, again, in part by MindCom. Woo, go 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. The vision of Arctic Corp. Um, so rather than explain who they are, I have a, a quick uh, seven-second video to show you. Wait, hold on one second. Sorry, that's nine seconds. Okay. Let's see if we can get this baby to play. Here we go. I've been instructed not to answer any questions um, about that video. Um, there is a, uh, a slow time release quantum code decryption that is coherent with your brain geometry and will propagate and align with your 3D consciousness once the super communication system uplink has been fully integrated. So one to three days, you should get the message depending on level of sequencing and openness and all that stuff. Um, now, a number of people have inquired about Mindcom, and, and like I've told them, I'll tell you, if you ask me, there's no point in asking, since while their agenda is both clear and confusing, their uh, point of origin, location, and infrastructure remain shrouded in mystery. And if you do want to know more, they probably already know, and will likely or not likely approach you at a time and location deemed appropriate or inappropriate. But things are changing at Minecom. They uh, recently hired a new ethereal decorator. Um, they're kind of tired of hiding in the shadows, you know. So with that said, um, two Minecom associates are finally going to make an appearance. Uh, it didn't work out last year, as our two associates were detained while en route from a remote IHOP location. Um, infiltrated by a uh, Black Ops Flapjack squadron. Um, but in lieu of that skirmish, two uh, associates will make an appearance. Uh, Dr. Stilly Dan Horney from Operations Management will titillate us with uh, updated vision and missionary position. <laughs> and uh, Trillion Linux from Tech will follow the briefing on their updated nanosynaptic interface mind app storm cloud development. Now this is not going to be, it's not going to be a traditional delivery method, um, but rather these associates will dazzle us with Gurdjieffian whirling dervish interpretive dance moves. Very similar to the hypnotic moves of kitchen break dancing induced by culinary alchemical kundalini fusion energy. Now we also have the distinct pleasure of introducing, uh, or having rather, another Whirling Dervish master join these two associates tomorrow night. Uh, someone who never needs an introduction unless someone doesn't know who he is. Um, but hopefully most of us, well all of us do, because his smooth yet prickly essence percolates the space-time fabric like a Satiri Maui bullet ant rite of passage mitten. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Ball. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that whirling dervish. Um, and it's quite a story, actually. Uh, I would like to recount that story with you guys. If you give me a second while I cue up the music. Here's Martin. <laughs> I first lay witness to Martin's whirling dervish just after a Bjork concert at an all-night Kaikion rave at a remote ice tundra just outside of Ayedfia Lierkatil. It was one of those unforgettable nights. The wind was cold and crisp. Aurora Borealis was engaging in its electric ethereal dance. Ice cold moonbeams were like bridges to a distant cosmos. And there you were. <laughs> Not a care in the world. Twirling feverishly like a Kansas twister. 
a divine whim, breaking barriers like Chuck Yeager on a DMT drip. <laughs> it was then when I knew at the essence of my very core, without a shadow of a doubt, to which all those profoundly rich and cosmically poignant signs were pointing toward, that I was doing it wrong. My technique was flawed. What I learned that night from you would change it all forever. You go, Martin. <laughs> Let the universe spin you. That's what I learned. Of course, let the universe spin you. Brilliant, just brilliant. So thank you. getting gefelte in my connectica zoink. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get into a little bit of meat. Those were kind of some hors d'oeuvres and... Um, you got about five minutes. Oh my God. Okay, well, let's just skip that then. It's not important. It's not important. Um, there's a lot going on with psychedelics. I was gonna try to like, basically, I've worked it out for you guys and come up with some equations, but um, you know, it's like metal projections, stargate astral travel. I mean, are we really in the presence of quivering purple bioluminescent fiber tendrils, you know, serving as the tapestry of some wounded Fisher King digital god in the, inner depths of some adamantium hive labyrinth within the far galactic spiral uh, near Rigel 7? The answer is of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> One really intriguing um, aspect of the psychedelic experience is that we live in a reality so peculiar and profound and teeming with life beyond our wildest imagination. And we're, you know, we're connected to that powerful force throughout the entire cosmos. We're remarkable beings immersed in a surreal, living, miraculous matrix. Um, and, you know, it's like, there's no way life is mundane. It has to be a sci-fi novel beyond the wildest sci-fi novel ever written. Although I guess it has been written, and we're in it. But, um, I remember, you know, Terrence McKenna saying, I don't do great impressions, but uh, don't give in to astonishment. Dude, what are you talking about? I mean, revel in that shit. The miracle is the message. Um, I mean, yeah, not being astonished. It's good advice if you're like a Middle Earth swashbuckling hobbit, you know, looking to avoid nefarious pitfalls and trances by behemoth one-eyed creatures while searching for the crown of Gondor or like the Arkenstone or something like that. Um, but you know, strong psychedelic experiences have uh, really given me a taste for the absurd, that, that kind of stretching of the, the prophylaxis and, uh, and, and all the little demons and angels and pixies of repressed trauma and happy memories and worlds within worlds um, get awakened and unfurled, and you, and the circus ensues as you revel in your muse. Um, so, two minutes? All right, here we go. Um, one little last thing I wanted to end on here is um, not that or that. <laughs> But there's really interesting things going on around us, and I'm, and I'm sort of like a, um, an armchair anthropologist, right? So data is disappearing into the clouds, right? The, the digital realm is being resurrected like the Christos into the material flesh through 3D printing. Um, 
art is assimilated into the abstract ether. Uh, did you know this, guys? That they there's like um, they've done away with the space between a period and the next sentence, right? And then like APA is like, no, you don't need headers. Uh, so what's so what's suspicious here, right? It's like. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, there's sans serif as a good example. In the late 60s, serif was sort of a way to like ease that tension, that cultural tension. And then sans serif, it, it, even font reflects cultural tension. Um, you know, so what's happening? It's like this loss of space. It's getting saturated and crowded. And uh, we yearn for freedom and space and uh, spirit and tribalism and intergalactic federations, minus the savage Klingon invasions, of course. Um, so, in closing, um, the great question is, you know, how can this transform consciousness and culture? And um, at dinner break, I wrote this down because I want to work things out and so you guys can just chill and relax, okay? Um, <laughs> so, by using modular and non-modular ephemeralization, or doing more and more with less and less until we can achieve everything with nothing, we can accelerate... Um, an increase in the efficiency of achieving more with less while going so far beyond the box, surrounding the box, we once called our modular existence. Uh, we should not be able to distinguish the very box from whence we came with the parameters to which against it is compared, nor should we consider a bottom-up approach that begins from a place from which a bottom is no longer a valid and viable option. Those were the old days when they were clearly defined and designated conceptual spaces. Now it's a virtual reality vertigo. With that, quad era demonstratum, thank you, I've been wonderful, and so have you.